I want to make a special uh, lecture on the structure of proteins because I figure we talk so much about them that I think I owe to you that I talk about uh, uh, protein structure a little bit before we go on. Okay, so. Okay, so maybe we turn the light off a little bit. So uh, we will be talking about the protein ubiquitin. Uh, you, it, is, it is a case study, but we go a little bit beyond the case study here. Uh, but uh, we, we start out by uh, commenting on the, the detailed structure of ubiquitin. And ubiquitin in the protein is made of 20 amino acids. And here are um, the amino acids uh, uh, listed. And uh, they are being coded uh, by the DNA in the cell. And here you see uh, uh, what amino acid triples, uh, what, what uh, base pair triples are coding for, uh, for the various uh, amino acids. Now we are not talking about the genetic part, but we just want to talk about the physical properties of the amino acids uh, today. And so uh, we, we just introduce the amino acids. So we begin by uh, noticing that uh, the amino acids are building blocks that are all the same. They contain a carbon, carbon, a nitrogen. And here the carbon is involved in OH and CO bonds. And um, the key difference for the 20 amino acid is that, that uh, the central carbon, the so-called alpha carbon, has uh, an a side group sticking out. Uh, so here the side group on this side is just a hydrogen. And here it is a longer chemical uh, moiety. And uh, by varying this side group, we have 20 different choices. We can vary the sequence of a protein by joining this one with this one. And thereby we can get, uh, uh, we can get then all the different pro proteins with their different properties. The joining happens in form of a um, peptide bond. And though if you look here, you're taking these two hydrogens and uh, this oxygen out and form a water molecule. And uh, the remaining piece here, this bond here, is now going then um, to the nitrogen, and you are getting now this kind of compound. And you can reverse this in a reaction that's called hydrolysis. That's not a spontaneous <coughs> reaction, since the bond is pretty uh, firm, but it can be catalyzed, and so you can hydrolyze uh, the back reaction. Uh, and it's a rather common reaction. You need certain enzymes for it, and we will even mention it a little bit uh, later, a little bit uh, briefly. So now you see that you have now the first uh, 
amino acid, you add it the second amino acid. It starts with the nitrogen and goes then to the first CO, and then in the second nitrogen goes to the second CO. You call this one the N terminus because of the nitrogen, and this one you call the C terminus because of the carbon or CO bond. And so this way you can now go on and on and make a protein, <coughs> uh, for example, one that is 76 amino acids long and in case of ubiquitin. And uh, the key difference, and I mentioned already, are the thigh groups that, uh, that give now a lot of variety. There are 20 different choices at each position. And so you're getting actually a huge, uh, uh, a huge choice uh, and <coughs> that way you can make many different proteins. So we, we, we look at, the, at this protein with the program VMD. You, you know this already a little bit, so I jump over this and now we go to the 20 amino acids. So the 20 amino acids can be grouped in, uh, in, in uh, three classes non-polar amino acids, charged amino acids, and polar amino acids. So these amino acids are um, really <coughs> extremely uh, essential for the physical and chemical properties of uh, biomolecules. Uh, they give the molecules their structure, but in particular also their functional properties and the relationship between the composition of proteins and their structure and function is uh, um, governed in many, many uh, uh, courses, uh, like in biochemistry and, uh, and in molecular biology courses. Here you see three books that I can recommend. The, the first book is sort of like a middle-sized book that, uh, that uh, uh, um, if those who want to know intermediate knowledge. <coughs> uh, the second book is what you may call the Bible. It's really fat, and, uh, but for, for the, it's quite expensive, but for the dollar per weight, it's actually very cheap. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's sold by the pyramids uh, in major universities, like if you go to the University of Chicago, probably our bookshop has also some, but if you go to major uh, biology-oriented universities uh, like Harvard and, uh, and Caltech and Stanford, you find huge piles of, uh, of these books that are being sold to students. It's in a way a really good deal because the, um, the books are really kept up to date since they sell very well. They can really invest in the, in the presentation. Now we have an edition that is a little bit dated but I think there might be only new out, I don't know, or it coming out any moment. And it's always very exciting to get the next edition because in biology, you are, uh, when you learn more, you understand more. In, in physics, sometimes one has the impression when you learn more, you understand less because it's, physics becomes, in a way, more branched out and, and complicated. Whereas in biology, we know so little that in the old days, the wise professor had all these unrelated facts in the back of his head or her head and somehow unconsciously could tie things together, but a normal person couldn't. But now what happened in biology is that more and more facts are established that rationalize biology, that link things together and then you have uh, then the situation when you make a new discovery, you put it in the book, you say, oh, of course, no, it's obvious. Before I had no clue why something worked the way it did. So a very good book for anybody who has a serious interest in uh, biological physics. This book here is the essence of the structure of proteins. Uh, it's a much thinner book, very well written, and so that is a book for people who really want to know the principles. Uh, I would actually buy both. You know, this one is a fat book, has a lot, very comprehensive, and this one is uh, the one that you can learn quickly or find things very quickly, and it's more structure-oriented, where this one is more cell biology-oriented. 
Anyway, so, uh, so here are the 20 amino acids and uh, I worked for, on proteins for more than 40 years now and I can tell you I met all of them and all of them are dear friends of mine. They, they helped me establish my career. I can tell you many stories about, you know, from great paper I wrote where they figured prominently, where I learned a lot, where I had an exciting moment in my life. And so I feel like they're old friends and, uh, and uh, comrades and uh, they not only serve the proteins well, but also they serve the scientists well by really resolving the, um, the function of proteins in terms of their structure at the level already of the individual amino acid very nicely. So let's now talk about them. And so we go, we go down this, this list of amino acids. And uh, here we have already a little bit of, a, um, of an oddity. Maybe I go one slide back. Um, oh, where is it? Oops. Ah, here, here, here we see them. Okay, are good. Okay, so when we look here, you can hardly see it here. Then you, we, we find actually three names for them. One is the full name, in this case Alanin. One is a short name, in this case Allah. And one is a one letter name. So you need them actually all. The full name, you know, this is just a full name and good. The, the three letter name you should use most of the time. That's very reminiscent of the, of the protein. It's as good as the full name. And uh, very often it comes with a number that tells you which uh, amino acid number wise it is in a protein. For example, there might be ALA5, that means it's the fifth amino acid in the protein and it is an alanine. Uh, the one letter word is uh, actually very useful if you want to uh, 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 write down the sequence. If you would write, write down the sequence, you would write alanine, uh, um, uh, fiofitin, uh, lysine. That's very complicated, very long, and where at the beginning and One letter is, you know, every letter is an amino acid. Now you have a problem that alanine has the same first a first letter as aspartate here, so you cannot call both of them A, so you must learn a little bit that this uh, aspartate is actually a D and the alanine is the A. And uh, some people immediately derive out of this um, some uh, strange uh, desire to show how smart they are and use always the short amino acid code. Uh, I would not recommend this. You should usually use a three-letter code uh, and only use a one-letter code when you really have to be very succinct, which happens actually very often, like in figures, for example. Uh, you just don't have the space. Use a one-letter code, but don't use it just to show that you're smart and make it a little bit difficult for others to follow you. Um, the three-letter code is really the best to use. Okay, so here we have a hydrophobic amino acid, and it's made here, the, 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 the side group sticking out, that's how you call these uh, uh, R1s, or uh, you, uh, you call them side groups. They are, um, uh, it's in this case just a methyl group. So methyl, we know it's from chemistry, it's uh, hydrophobic. And so clear it's a hydrophobic molecule. Now we have, um, however, more. So we have seven. The next one is a little bigger. So it's basically the same thing, methyl, methyl. Here, you know, not, uh, not uh, just one hydrogen because we, we branch it out. But here we have a um, hydrocarbon here, an, an aliphatic uh, hydrocarbon, so very um, very known polar hates water and uh, they love to stick together to themselves. Aliphatic hydrocarbons love themselves and uh, because they hate water so much that they stick close. And uh, that is an important driving force for forming actually the geometry of proteins. So then we have another shape and that is a phenylalanine, a very different shape, a ring shape. 
um, this uh, phenylalanine is actually just like the, the carotenoids we talked about, the, the retinal. It's a pi system here. So we have your pi electron moving around. They don't have particular interesting optical properties because they absorb way in the UV, but, uh, but they make interesting interactions. Through the geometry, they can slit in pockets. And they can also stack on top of other rings that also have pi system. Then you get pi pi stacking. So they have actually very strong interaction, despite the fact that they are very hydrophobic. And uh, then we have here a very odd amino acid. Whenever it arises, you, you, you put an exclamation mark. This is an amino acid where the side group is not sticking out, but actually turning back into the amino acid to the nitrogen. This way you're getting a ring, and this is the only one that does it. And as a result, you have here an, uh, an amino acid bond, a peptide bond. You have here another peptide bond. And look at it, it's almost 90 degrees. So the proline enforces on two consecutive bonds an orient reorientation change by about 90 degrees. So it enforces a corner an edge in the geometry of a, of an, um, uh, of a protein. So if we go then, uh, here we have a protein that, uh, a thigh group that is very, very famous. Uh, it's uh, the sulfur, but the fame comes mainly from the fact that it is very often the first amino acid of a protein. So that, that the world knows, oh, here's, here's come the fresh protein. I'm uh, the messiah in tells the world, this is the first uh, amino acid. So the following will be now a few, 10 or a few hundred amino acids long. And so that is uh, so like a signal that, that uh, the proteins used to sort of characterize themselves. And now we come to the two most bulky ones. It's isoleucine, then we have one carbon that branches now into one methyl group and, uh, and another little aliphatic chain here of two carbons. And we have uh, something very similar, where we have first two carbons out and then branching. So we can come out with one, two, and then we branch, this is leucine. Leucine branches longer than isoleucine, so it's more flexible. Isoleucine is very bulky, and at the same time rather, rather firm, oh sorry, and at the same time rather firm, and so it's a very stiff hydrophobic group, and so for example some channels, channel protein that want to close and make an hydrophobic kill plug so that nothing can go through the channel. They often form a ring of, uh, of several isoleucines that come from all sides, and uh, that ring is in a real tight seal that uh, nothing can penetrate because it's very hydrophobic and at the same time very rigid, and so it, it, uh, it closes the door uh, until business is open again. So, so you see here that you have many kinds of forms, of shapes, and that is actually connected with the function of the, of the hydrophobic groups. They are sticking to the inside of proteins often and to go away from the water, from the, from the aqueous surface. And in the inside, they, they attract each other because they're hydrophobic, but they also pack together very closely. And so to get now uniqueness, you need unique shapes. And so here you have then various shapes that the proteins realize and thereby they can also realize then very specific what is, what is called a hydrophobic core of a protein that, um, that has a property that is not very flexible because they are very um, universal in their shape and they can go any place. No, they're very specific. They like to be at certain places more than others. And that is why you are getting, uh, um, you know, a general tendency to get hydrophobic elements together. But at the same time, because you have these seven shapes, you can give them also uniqueness in doing so. So these are the 
the, the hydrophobic ones. Now we come to the charged ones, and there are two, posit there are two uh, negatively charged ones and two positively charged ones. And so let's go to the, to the, um, to the uh, negatively charged one. The first one is an aspartate. You come out with, uh, with the carbon and the second carbon, and then you branch. And you have now here an oxygen and oxygen, and you uh, very often spread the negative charge um, in a quantum mechanical way across both of these oxygens, so that each of them has one half a charge, because the, the quantum particles are delocalized, the electrons, and so you're getting actually a half charge here, half charge here. But as soon as the proton comes, the negative charge goes here to make a hydrogen bond to the proton, and then this one becomes neutral. So you have sort of like a distribution of the charge, but uh, you can also localize it when you're making a hydrogen bond. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the aspartate ever form a peptide bond? Like, the, does that ever form a peptide bond rather than? No, 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 no. That is, uh, that is, uh, that, that constellation here is uh, yeah, a little bit like, um, but they, they, they don't form a bond, but they are very often involved in in a sort of bond formation indirectly uh, in enzymes as catalysts. And I'm pretty sure sometimes they actually form intermediately a bond, and then the bond is broken again. But they are not, uh, but they are not, uh, uh, have any tendency to form a bond. They have only one amino acid uh, that forms a bond, that's cysteine, that will come there in a second. So, so that aspartate, and there is an, an, uh, an uh, almost identical amino acid glutamate that has three carbons, so it reaches out a little further, and that's more flexible, and that is more like when you need a charge-charge interaction, but in a more flexible, extended way when you use a glutamate. Whereas the aspartate is more inside the protein, more rigid and geometrically well-defined situation. So uh, then we have here the positive ones. The lysine stretches out further than the glutamate and the, and the, and the aspartate. It has one, two, three, four uh, carbons here and then a nitrogen, so it's rather far away. Here we have three hydrogens, but one of the hydrogens is actually a proton, so this is an NH3 plus group. And uh, so that's uh, uh, had a further reach. I don't know why these guys have a further reach, the positive ones and the negative ones. I, uh, I wanted to know, but I just cannot give you a simple answer for that. The arginine is reaching even further, it's also positive. And here you have the two nitrogens that have also here the two H's here and can have a third H and then you have an NH3 plus either here or there. And so that is an even further reach. Arginine is a very unique group that uh, is involved like uh, called an arginine finger in catalyzing reactions like a spark plug for molecular motors. When the finger comes, then the reaction goes. If you pull it, the finger away, then it's not there. And so through geometrical changes, you can then make a motor go or not go. So it's uh, quite an amazing uh, side group. And so now we have then the polar ones. The polar ones are sort of a little bit more mundane, just like the aliphatic ones, the hydrophobic ones. Here, the first one is a serine. It has here a dipole moment. And it um, looks sort of innocent, but uh, it's actually much more crafty than you imagine it is, because the polarity comes from this dipole moment. And now, when you rotate around this bond, you can change the dipole moment from plus to negative. You can also rotate around this bond easily to move the, the dipole around. So the, the, the protein just in its pocket almost, with very, very little geometrical needs, it can change the, the direction of its polarity, and it can also extend it uh, to different places. So this is uh, quite an amazing um, 
uh, ability. You foresee that same ability in threonin. We have here the, the, the dipole moment again. It can just flip back. And the other proteins that are polar act more like ocean liners. That you know, you have a polar molecule like an elephant, and it has to rotate around to change its polarity. It needs lots of space and cannot compete with these guys. They just go like this, like this. very strong polarity change. And, and, uh, and with very little geometrical uh, uh, cost. So then we have tyrosine that has an OH uh, in front of, an, of a ring. There's again a ring that has pi conjugation, so you have stacking interactions. So this is sort of like a mixed, uh, a mixed property. Here we have hydrophobic property, and here we have polar property, which is actually uh, true for many of these that they have mixed properties, like lysine, for example, was always considered to be a charged and hydro, uh, uh, hydrophilic uh, amino acid. That's true here. People thought always a charge. But look here, you have aliphatic, 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 very hydrophobic. So this, this molecule is actually hydrophobic at the same time as it is charged. So it's really like a, like an, uh, uh, how do you call them? Like a, it has really two, two faces. And, uh, and so one has to realize that these groups, when you just group them like this, is really a simplification, oversimplification. And you should just uh, not uh, be too, too unsophisticated in judging how these systems really behave. OK, so the histidine is a nightmare of any graduate student, because the histidine here has a five ring with two nitrogens. And uh, here we have a proton, uh, uh, at the, or not a proton, but a hydrogen, but it's polar, at this place. But we can also have a proton at this, uh, hydrogen at this place. And they're inequivalent. And so you need to know which one has actually the hydrogen and which one has a, maybe forming a an, an hydrogen bond with a proton to the outside. And so you need to know this, and many, many errors have been made in, in, in series, and the whole series had to be rewritten because you, you assumed the wrong protonation state. You can also have no proton, and you can have two, uh, no hydrogen, you can have a second at both places one. So it's, uh, it's, uh, there are quite a few states possible, but anyway, you can you have these two sort of equivalent nitrogens, however, different enough that you need to know who is doing what. OK, so uh, the, this is a cysteine that's the only one that really loves to make a covalent bond uh, with the sulfur. If you have two cysteines in the neighborhood, then you can, uh, then you can uh, make a sulfur-sulfur bond. And proteins do that to form a very stable structure, because when you, 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 you cross certain part of the protein with a sulfur-sulfur bond, holds it together. But these proteins are really confusing poor researchers, because what was found is that when the proteins fold, they first make one kind of sulfur-sulfur bond, and only at the end do they make the one that is really stabilizing the structure most? So they use it as an intermediate, uh, as an intermediate step. Now in the lab, you use cysteine uh, in sulfur-sulfur bonds to show which parts of a protein uh, are actually close to each other. For example, if I would be a protein and the wall would be another protein, then what the researcher would make it would smuggle on my head a cysteine could be that then I'm not a functioning protein anymore, but very often you can actually put a cysteine and the protein is fine with the protein. And then you put one cysteine there, and then, um, and then they, uh, they, they find out if there is a bond between us. So if I go here, go here, the chuk, I'm connected. And then I swear, like, oh, I've never been close to that wall. It's a big lie. But no, 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 I was there. They, they could check the cysteine-cysteine bond. And this way they knew who was ever close together. So it's a very um, common 
uh, technology in the laboratory for proximity measurements, you call that cross-linking. And so, uh, but anyway, for that is uh, an, an unusual and interesting amino acid. And uh, then we have asparagine, it's a little bit like aspartate, but neutral, just polar. Same for glutamine, a little bit like glutamate, but polar. A tryptophan is, a, is a, the elephant among the, the amino acids. It has a six ring and a five ring. And uh, the, the, uh, the tryptophan is an amino acid that is all by itself. Many amino acids you can replace by another amino acid that is sort of similar, not the tryptophan. The tryptophan doesn't want to be replaced by anything else. So if you find in the protein, try to put something else there, the protein is not going to do too well. So it's sort of like a big, bulky monstrosity that is involved in pi conjugation, in filling space, in, in uh, going into pockets. Uh, it's, it it has a lot of uniqueness. Very unique is the other extreme amino acid, namely the glycine. The glycine has as a side group only hydrogen. Now you think that's really innocent, but not at all. This is really a very interesting side group. First, um, the chemical properties here is really quite different from those because there's no real, real side group there. But the main point you find it is that uh, 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 all these amino acid side groups are pretty bulky. So when you have a when you have a protein, it's surrounded by this wild hair sticking out. And, uh, and, uh, and, and controlling the approach, whereas um, the glycine has no sticky hair. So this is where you can then get one or two amino acids very close together and clicking together and, uh, and, 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 f and forming then really a very tight fit. For example, when you want to link two helices together at a certain angle, then you just give the two helices either each one glycine or sometimes two or even three glycines and they're really close and hug each other there and you cannot move them apart easily. And so that is sort of like a, like a button almost on proteins where you can click proteins together. So these are the 20 amino acids. I didn't do any justice to them. You can tell, you can write a book on each of the amino acids and a wonderful book and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and big story. You can also ask, why do we have 20 amino acids? Why do we have these 20 amino acids? So first is that the 20 amino acids are deeply ingrained in the genetic code. So if we would have some species on Earth that have some type of amino acid other than others, that would lead to a huge screw up on, of the biosphere. And so the life decided very early on that the only way to handle it is uh, to have all life forms assume the same 20 amino acids. Now that's true for, for life forms, but there are actually some, some very uh, uh, gifted, uh, brilliant experimentalists who succeeded in making a 21st, a 22nd, a 23rd amino acid by artificially uh, altering the genetic code and linking it to an artificial amino acid. And, uh, and so today, actually, when you go to the lab, for example, of Schultz in the, in the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, you find that they introduce actually in living species other amino acids um, to control things better and, uh, and uh, or use them as labels and so on. And uh, we are ourselves involved in some research where we want to make an amino acid that is used as an optical label or as a spin label to, to, to study uh, proteins. So, uh, so, but anyway, why these 20? Since they are everywhere and connected with the genetic code, which is very old, the, the decision for the amino acid was made uh, long ago. So in the sort of pretty much towards the beginning of life. And people think that, that life came actually 
from a state that is called the RNA world, where living systems were mainly made of RNA. This is sort of an hypothesis and, and not a really uh, established knowledge. But, um, but uh, um, there is a good point to it. And so then likely the amino acids were the first partners of the RNA. And the amino acids were then chosen out of the partnership between protein and RNA. And those 20 amino acids were probably doing a good job in interacting nicely with the, with the RNA. And then they were sort of chosen. And now, later, the proteins became a big business by themselves. But uh, one couldn't change the 20 amino acids anymore. That's likely the scenario and the explanation for why do we have these particular amino acids. And these amino acids can do really wondrous things in interacting with RNA and DNA. It's just amazing how they can feel the, the DNA and the RNA, recognize sequences there, interact very nicely with it. And it's a tremendous relationship between the two brought about by these amino acids. OK. So uh, uh, is there a question? Yes? Amino acids, how are they assembled? I mean, like, how are the molecules made? OK, OK, OK. Yeah, so that is, uh, uh, OK, good. I tell you, maybe we turn the light on. And I actually, this is my second lecture this afternoon. So I, I just sit down for a second. and. Uh, and, 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 and you will realize I love to tell you because it's a hot research project in my group. And, uh, and so, so the, the, the proteins are being synthesized in the, by the ribosome. The ribosome is uh, uh, in every cell, in every living cell. I told you already one molecular machine in every living cell, namely in almost every living cell, namely ATP synthase. The ribosome is really in every living cell. And the ribosome is actually made mainly of RNA, but it has also uh, many proteins. And uh, the, the ribosome is uh, um, synthesizing the ATP. The proteins help and organize, but the synthesis itself is made by the RNA. They don't let the protein touch the synthesis process. That's too important. That is, that is you know, uh, director business here. You proteins, you are just, uh, we make you, but you are not involved in making yourself. OK, so how does it work? Uh, the, the, the cell has DNA to write down its genetic information. Now, when the DNA is read, you need someone to read it. You could imagine that the ribosome that makes proteins need to read the genetic information, but that's not how it works. The DNA sequence is first translated into an RNA, actually so-called messenger RNA that contains also a very specific sequence that codes as well as a DNA does the, the protein. But it's a single strand rather than a double strand. And so this messenger is, RNA is made in the nucleus and then transported or in the bacterial cell, in the cell, and then put to uh, places where where the proteins are synthesized. Now, uh, depends on the state of a cell, you can, um, you can have few ribosomes, but in a healthy cell, very often you have thousands of ribosomes. Everywhere you look at, oh, it's a ribosome, ribosome, ribosome. Everywhere they make new proteins. 30% uh, of them are on the membrane, because 30% of the protein in the cell are actually membrane proteins. So you synthesize them right where they are needed in the membrane. But anyway, the, the ribosomes, they read the, the, the messenger RNA three bases at a time. And, uh, and, uh, and, and from that, from that uh, sequence, they recruit then accordingly 
uh, an amino acid in what is called the transfer RNA. The transfer RNA is an RNA that can read always three uh, bases on the, on the messenger RNA and bring the right amino acid for it that correspond to that colon. And so these uh, tRNAs, they bind to the ribosome. They recognize then this, uh, this match. Oh, oh, this is not my match here. I was totally misled here. I leave you. Oh, this is again not my match. I leave you. Now comes the right one. Oh, this matches. I match here. I, um, I bring the right ribosome for this, uh, the right amino acid for this match. And then the, a signal is sent. The, the ribosome is a huge, huge complex. And it's sent straight through, 100 angstrom wide. A message is sent. Full hit on the messenger RNA. We recognized the codon. And now we have the right next uh, uh, amino acid. In initiate a reaction. And then there is some uh, process going on that brings now this, tra this transfer RNA with this amino acid to the protein that is already synthesized and adds now this new amino acid to the protein. And then the protein is one amino acid longer. And then it goes on and on and on. Now, you can imagine on and on, there's a lot of processes and really interesting things happening. It's the most fundamental macromolecular system in cells. So it is hugely basic, hugely important. And, uh, and we only began to investigate it like since about you know, 10, 20 years on the level of physics that we know the structure and that we can really figure out the details. So we know the existence for a long time, we knew certain features for a long time, but only now can we really go and look at every step at the atomic, chemical, physical level. Uh, but, but before the tRNAs bring the amino acids, mm -hmm. uh, how are the amino acids made from maybe water? <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, some of them are being made uh, by, um, by getting them out of the environment. So many, many uh, cells are just uh, getting them from the environment, like you. You are, you are eating plants, you're eating, uh, uh, you're eating meat or fish, and that's how you get very often also your amino acid. You don't degrade it completely and start from scratch. But you you uh, you uh, make some amino you get some amino acids. You call them essential amino acids. You need them from outside. But then the other amino acids, they have a chemistry in your body that make that synthesize those amino acids. The more primitive an organism, the more amino acid it makes itself, and the more advanced and lazy quote it is, uh, you, the more you rely on, on, on amino acid in your diet. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a big subject that I, you know, what I'm telling you now in, in you know, there's this famous um, uh, abridged uh, Shakespeare, you get all the, all the works of Shakespeare in one hour, that's what I do with the molecular biology and biochemistry now. I give you the story in one hour that, that the, across Green Street, you, it takes you two years to study this. Okay, good. So maybe turn off a little bit again. And now we look a little bit more closely to the, to the, uh, to the amino acids. Uh, and uh, to, to, to the proteins, and then we find that in the proteins we have first what is called the primary structure, which is just a sequence of amino acids. And now this structure forms what is called a secondary structure, and there are two types of structures that are particularly uh, uh, um, uh, stable. One of them is a helix. You make a stake staircase, and you repeat in a cylinder, you repeat and repeat. And now from amino acid group one to one amino acid four further, namely five, you're making a hydrogen bond with a, with a, with a, a amino acid backbone atoms, the CO and the NH that form the, 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 what you call the backbone of the amino acid, not the side groups. You're making here hydrogen bonds, 
and so one with five, two with six, three with seven, and so on, and you're getting then a staircase structure. And there are also some helices, this is what you, you call a one four helix, which is the most common one. There are also one three helices. They are a little tighter. You right? make an one amino acid goes only three up. So you go then from one to four, from two to five, and so on. Then you're getting a tighter helix. And, uh, but that's energetically more costly, but very interesting because you can turn a one four helix into a one five helix, a uh, one three helix. And, uh, and getting a very interesting change uh, in, in the protein. For example, very, very crucial in, 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 uh, for the physio neurophysiology of, uh, uh, for the electrophysiology of neurons. So this is one, the helix. And the second one is the, um, if that you have one amino acid strand going like this, and one amino acid strand <coughs> going parallel to it, and are parallel, so here N, C, uh, or anti-parallel. Here we actually have, uh, uh, here we have actually anti-parallel, N, C, and N, C, but we can also go N, C, N, C, so they go in parallel. And now we have also hydrogen bonds, but across between two strands that are running in parallel. And the outcome is that here we have this helical thing where the side groups go in all direction out, and here we have where the side groups go either up or either down. So there we have a plane, and then the side groups go down or up, and always alternately, uh, uh, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So, uh, so, so, so this way you get uh, the, 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 your side groups being arranged uh, in a very different way. Okay, and so we have then also what is called the tertiary structure. And this is how we put the secondary structure elements together. For example, here we have a helix sitting on top of a beta sheet. And so this arrangement inside the protein we call the tertiary structure. How are these secondary structure elements, the helices, relative to the other helices and relative to the to the beta strands, and then we have the quaternary structure where we put several proteins that are independent of each other, not bound together, how we complex them into one sort of bigger protein, and that is a quaternary. So we have primary sequence, secondary helices and, um, and uh, beta strands, and tertiary, how we put the helices and beta strands together, and quaternary, how we put different proteins together. Okay, and so now we, we look at those systems for ubiquitin and uh, we want to look at it. And so I, I now do, uh, I now use the VMD program. And uh, so let me fire it up. Uh, here um, my VMD last version. I make a big, nice window that we can see it well. And I uh, put, um, I change the color to, to, to white rather than black. So let me change the background color to white. Okay, good. And so now I, I go then and uh, and take a load of protein. Uh, you can here put in the PDB identifier. That means uh, the, there's a protein data bank out there uh, that uh, contains all protein structures that we know. And, uh, but in this uh, data bank, you, you usually don't have the hydrogen atoms because you cannot really resolve them well and then people don't put them, but they're easy to add. Easy to add. But the structure looks a little odd without the hydrogen, so I, I, I stored it myself here. And so I, I go then, um, I now browse here in my, on my computer, and I just uh, find one where I put one. Okay, here is the ubiquitin. And now I open the file and I load it. And so here I have it. And here you see 
the ubiquitin inside there in blue, the outside, what is that? Now you can guess what it is. Um, I make a representation here where I look at what I have and I just do it by van der Waals spheres. And now you see that I have a, a box of water that contains a protein. If I make the bo box of water a transparent and um, a sorry, oops, this is, uh, I have everything is here no transparent, I make this only the water transparent, so I write here water, and now the water is transparent, but I have to also now add the, the protein, so I add the protein. So now, that inside there's a protein, and now the, the water is transparent, what I can do is I can do, uh, um, make the transparency a little nicer by, uh, going here, choosing a little bit better rendering style. And so now you see there the protein inside there, inside of this water. And so, okay, so we are not interested in the water. So we take the water away. And so now we just have the protein. Now the protein itself, if I scale it up, is not really very interesting. Oh, I made it also transparent. I don't want it. I want to make it opaque. The, oh, sorry, I hope I make too many mistakes here. So here, so, so I make it opaque. So this is a, the water, the, the, the protein molecule doesn't look very interesting. It has 76 amino acids. And uh, you know, you, you see too much. You see every atom and doesn't tell you much. So you want to simplify it. So one way to simplify it is actually to just draw the surface of the protein. So we, we draw the surface of the protein uh, here, so good. And now we, we color the surface by amino acid type. We just learned about amino acid types. And here we have the surface by amino acid type. Blue is po positive, red is negative, uh, green is, uh, is uh, um, polar and white is non-polar. You see we have not too much white, uh, but we have some white. Why do we have some white there? You are very often, you cannot avoid it, but you very often also overlook the function of the protein. This protein, ubiquitin, is actually an address label. It doesn't come alo alone. The, 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 the ubiquitin is actually um, uh, has seven amino acids, seven lysine amino acids on the surface that are completely conserved from bacteria all the way to, 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 to Homo sapiens. And uh, so they're very essential. And the, with these amino acids, the, pro, the protein can stick themselves together. They can take the C terminus, which is this long tail there that you see here, and they can take that one here, so maybe I'll make it a little smaller and you can see it better. And so here's, here, so oops, here you see that the C terminus here and can connect it with one of the seven uh, lysines on the surface of the protein. And thereby they can write addresses. They take, for example, four ubiquitins and connect them all the C terminus to, to 48 of the next one, the C terminus to 48 of the next one, the C terminus to 48 of the fourth one, then they are connected 48, 48, 48. And then you're getting one kind of molecular shape, but in this, in this molecular shape, the, 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 the ubiquitin stick together, and the white, the white groups here are shared by the, by the ubiquitin, and that's where they like to hug each other, where they like to go together and form a certain geometry. And that geometry can then be recognized by the, by the post office, because uh, the, the, uh, the, these address labels decide 
or tell the protein where it has to go to the cell. Some proteins, for example, are excreted. They have some label. Some proteins go to the cell nucleus, and some that have the 48, 48, 48, have an address label that is also known under the label kiss of death. Because that label is being given to proteins that are misfolded, that are dangerous for the cell, and that should be discarded. But the cell has a very good garbage container. The garbage container immediately chews up the protein so that the amino acid can be reused for new synthesis. And so, so when you have a 48, 48, 48 label, then you write your will better right away because soon somebody grabs you by your label and pushes you into, pro into a protein complex called proteanome and chews you up. So let's look where that is. So we, we have here our, our surface. I would say we make the surface transparent. And now we want to see the inside structure of the protein. So we create another representation, but this time we make it uh, my favorite one, a new cartoon, structured by, by, uh, by, uh, by secondary structure type. So now I make this one opaque, and you see it inside. For a second, I take the, 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 the surface away, and here you see the amino acid type. You see here's the C-terminus. Where, the, where we connect it to the lysines. Here you see the, the, the beta strands in yellow, and you see in, 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 in magenta the helix. So here we see the secondary structure type. Now I told you about those important seven amino acids, the lysines. So let's find those. Sorry, sorry, oops. Yeah, so we do it, so we take now here. Um, we, uh, we are drawing here by, um, we don't put the protein, we only show the amino acids that are lysine. So I put here rest name, L, Y, S for lysine. And now I draw them as funeral spheres. And I color them by color ID there I chose, let's say, orange, because it's the number, a color that doesn't appear too often. Okay, now I make them real big and fat, that they really can be recognized easily. And now I add the surface back. And now I make the surface, so now I see everything together. The secondary structure, the, the seven lysines. And, um, and now I, now I, um, now I, uh, make the surface not transparent but opaque. And now you see where the lysines stick out. Those is where you can connect it. There are seven spots where you can connect it. Maybe a little bit bigger even. Maybe we see them even better. So here, here. And so make them even bigger. So here you see where the lysines stick out. This is where I can connect the terminus, the C terminus, to the rest of them. And, uh, and so that is how this is work. So you see that by, you know, I can really look around the protein and learn a about, lot about the protein by looking at the architecture, secondary structure, the surface, and so on and so on to make sense of it. Okay, good. So now end with uh, what, is this, what are these uh, things doing. So now I kill the VMD. Okay, good. And kill this one. Oop. And now I have to find my lecture again. So, and so now let's look a little bit more at the ubiquitin. I told you already some from just looking at it. And now we want to, we want to see. Here you see the address labeling of the ubiquitin. You take a protein, you add now one ubiquitin, and now you add a second, a third, and a fourth, and you can connect those now here through lysine 29. K is a short name for lysine. 
all through lysine 48 or lysine 63, all the same. But you can also do mixed, mixed addresses. But uh, very often you just have this kind of you know, straight addresses, all 29, 48. And uh, so, so this way you can recognize them because when you put them together like this and with the hydrophobic surfaces, they form different kind of complexes, a tetra uh, complex here. And, uh, and that can be recognized by the postmaster in the cell and, uh, and fish it out. So this one here is a real bad guy proteolysis, sure that you will be chewed up. And so I think we have a little bit of, uh, of some pictures of that. So here we have now the protein ubiquinated, uh, tetra ubiquinated with 48 connection. And here the proteasome, when you come close to it, it recognizes its label and uh, takes the ubiquitin off and puts the protein inside and chews it up in a, in a cavity. And this is really a very, very exciting structure that has just been solved only recently, and now we can do the physics of it. Here you see the so-called ruler that recognizes the four uh, K48 connected ubiquitins, and only those doesn't take the wrong kind of address label and choose up a good protein that's supposed to be excreted or go to the cell nucleus and uh, puts it now through a motor, through a protein motor, into the cavity. And, um, and um, yeah, here we have it again, sort of. And so here you see that in all the different kinds of species, all these seven uh, lysines that, that are forming the address label are all conserved, and there's a lot of similar or conserved amino acid in all those uh, uh, different species uh, amino acid from the amoebae all the way to C. elegant, it almost like human. And so it's a, it's a very, very conserved and, and uh, old protein. Okay, so, uh, so good. I have just one last quick show here. That's on protein folding. How do proteins assume their right form? So when they are synthesized, they come actually out pretty much as a stretched form, but then they have to find their form and they find it spontaneously. And here you see a protein that is now, that is just possible since only very few years, that is folded in the computer. So you see how the process goes. It's surrounded by water, and now you see after a while it took, takes a little search. Uh, you can, this protein folds itself. It's a very simple protein, uh, but uh, today actually this is a result, I think about almost 10 years old now. Uh, today we can fold proteins that are about three times as large as this one, and we are, we are getting better and better doing bigger and bigger ones. But you see really how the proteins have a natural tendency to fold. Here, um, way here sitting here with the yellow shirt, he's an expert uh, of protein folding. And so if you want to know, he can, he knows hundred times more than I about it. And so you see the process um, can be understood. And so this is now my last demo that I want to show you. So I go now again to my, to my VMD program. And uh, I go here and open the program, make the window bigger and wide. And uh, now we see real dynamics before we saw more or less static structure. Now we see real motion. So now we go and, uh, and uh, go here. I have to change the directory quickly to where all the stuff is. Okay, good. Want to be sure that I got it. Yes, I did, and now I read it. And uh, with all the nice uh, commands from, from, uh, from VMD, so now I read it. And there we go. And so now I have here the protein whole trajectory. And now if I, if I, um, if I um, run it, 
then it will be pretty chaotic. So if I run here, then it goes zoom. That's, ooh, you don't see much. So what we do is we low pass filter. We go here and do trajectory, and now we say low pass filter, but we show only the average of 10 windows. And so now you see much better how this protein is actually moving itself from a stretched out form uh, to, to slowly being folded. And now we can also add to this um, view a surface. So now we uh, I add another representation and I now show protein. So I don't show the water molecules because then you wouldn't see anything, but it's all in water and really done correctly. <coughs> and now I have to again do the trajectory and, and average over 10 windows. But now I want to draw it with a surface. And I make the surface uh, where the quick surf, what am I blind here? Let's quick surf. Do you guys see quick surf? Did I choose a, or oh, I might have chosen the wrong VMD? You opened up uh, original 1.8. Ah, so I have to do it again, sorry. Uh, uh, to do it again, ah. Okay, uh, I don't do it. It's, uh, what is the time? Ah, maybe I, uh, maybe I can do it quicker. I just chose the wrong one. That 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 new surface is. Uh, oh yeah, it's. I have to kill it now. Um, okay, I don't do it. So it can be done and you can then see really the surface and you see how the sausage is moving into the protein. You see inside, you know, how the secondary structure forms. Um, it's, uh, it's quite amazing and that can be actually looked at today. So after the protein is being formed by the, by the, by the, ribo, by the ribosome, um, there are two possibilities. If the protein is a membrane protein or excreted protein, it is sent through a channel to the outside of the cell or, or inside of the, of the membrane. It's weaved in the membrane because that's where it's supposed to be. If it's a, if it's a cytosolic protein that is, goes inside the cell, then it is being released directly into the cell, but initially being protected by a, by a protein called trigger factor that sits on top of the ribosome and makes sure that this newborn protein is not attacked by other proteins. Because before a protein is folded, it is vulnerable to, 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 to chemical attack. And so it helps it to fold. It also prevents it from being attacked by other proteins. And so there is basically a nanny waiting for the protein outside to help it a little, but the protein has to find uh, how it folds and has to then fold uh, more or less by itself. And uh, when it's a uh, perturbation, the protein has a natural tendency to fold back, but sometimes it doesn't go well, particularly if a protein is misfolded, there's a very high chance that the protein is now attaching itself to other proteins. Because it's misfolded, then it has its hydrophobic groups to the outside, and there's a very big chance, and many central nervous system diseases, like, like, um, like uh, med cow disease, uh, are uh, coming from misfolded proteins, Alzheimer, uh, um, diabetes, and so on, are coming from misfolded proteins. And so um, that's a very, very hot area of research for that reason. Um, okay, but you know, we can see also how the proteins fold. And, uh, and uh, so we've got now a little overview. So maybe just one minute for questions. If uh, maybe we turn on the light and then I maybe can answer a question or two. Mm -hmm.
Did you say how long it took the, uh, for instance, the villain protein to fold? Yes, yes, you know this. So the proteins have been actually designed to be so short to be folding fast. Because the experimentalists, they really would like to know from the computational people how it looks like. And so they are really strike a bargain with us. They modify the proteins so that they fold faster. They can see uh, the progress of folding, but they don't see the detail. They can say, oh, no, it looks like folded. Oh, that was in a microsecond. Klaus, can you not calculate a microsecond? And I say, mm, yeah, it cost me, but OK, I, I can try. And then they, I fold it, and they think, oh, good. And now let's do this experiment, that experiment suggested by the, by the folding simulations. And that's not only Klaus Schult and many people in the world are actually doing folding uh, simulations today to study that process. Here, to you, I only present it because you know the folding is really part of how a protein gets to its structure. Uh, most of it is, of course, about how does it carry out its function. But you know, initially, we want to know how do you, do you actually get the structure. OK. So um, did, you, did you say that the non-polar residue is used to bring the C-terminal end from other ubiquitins so that it comes to the proximity of lysine? Uh, yeah, so there are the enzymes that, uh, that are specialists in connecting and ubiquitin to another ubiquitin. That was actually the guy we, who discovered it, was actually a Nobel Prize, or three guys got the Nobel Prize for discovering this chemistry. So there are enzymes for the specific connection. So they take then one lysine, T-terminus, and put it together, either with lysine 48 or lysine 29 or lysine 63. I forgot the other numbers. And so, um, and thereby they can splice them together, and now you need a certain sequence of these enzymes to get a certain address written. And that is organized by what is, for example, called the quality uh, uh, control system in the cell that, that looks at proteins and for some reason, which we totally don't understand yet, can recognize if a protein is misfolded. And then it either gives it a second chance for refolding so you can also give it an address to say, OK, you get a second chance. Then you are being put into another um, uh, uh, big protein system, Groel, Groef, where you go in. And now you are being basically through a washing cycle. You, you are being changed a lot. And you come out now a fresh, well-folded protein. And again, the quality control system looks at you. Or you are helpless case. And then the quality control system says, sorry, and you're getting the 48s. And then you, you go to the proteodome that, that, uh, that, that digests you, chews you up. So I missed this part. So how is the nonpolar residue uh, working in that process? So mm -hmm. you showed us. Oh, 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 so so when, you take, uh, when you take four ubiquitins, then when you look at the crystal structure, it's not like one is here, the next one is here, the next one is here, the next one is here. They actually form a cube. Four of them, two here, two there, they form a cube. And not a, not a long, long line. And, uh, and when you look, why do they form a cube? Then you see that they put as much as possible the hydrophobic surfaces together. Because that gains some energy. Because when they're exposed to water, it's not so good in energy. But when they're exposed to, to, the, to each other, then it's, it is uh, energetically favorable. And that is sort of like something you overlooked. And that's often you have to realize proteins are often doing two or three jobs just like everybody else in the world nowadays. And so they have sometimes these spots for a reason that you cannot tell offhand from just knowing job one. Okay. Thank you very much.